welcome to the On Stage Podcast, where we interview musicians and members of the entertainment community. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. You can run on for a long time. Sooner or later, gotta cut you down. This court has no standard for determining intrinsic value. Your Honor, St. James has had a positive impact. The university concedes the plaintiff is not without merit, but we question the relevancy to this case. I don't know how bright you are, but I imagine you know why I'm here. I'm only gonna say this once. You are not to see my daughter. I've been down on bended knee, talking to the man from Galilee. He called my name and my heart stood still. When he said, John, go do my will. My life is in that car. All the memories I have left. Everything. Fuck your reservation. I've come for the boy. My boy. Do we have a deal? People got a certain way of doing things around here. The boy should have known his place. No one's hands are clean. Everyone, thank you very much for watching this episode of On Stage. We have very fabulous Yellowstone actor Barry Clifton with us today. He's considered a second act actor, and we will find out what that means. But he's uh, he's very good, and I'm so glad that we have him on our platform. Um, just so we start a little bit, he uh, began acting at age nine, performing at University of Arkansas of Fort Smith, and when age 15, he set acting aside and began following a long and winding road. Can you give us a little bit more about that and about your time in the theater as well? We're interested in knowing that one. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to be on the show. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, and theater was my first introduction to performing arts, and uh, it was my mother got me involved, and I, I still think that's one of the greatest gifts uh, a parent can give their child is uh a love of the arts, whatever, whatever form that might take. Uh, but uh, she, she introduced me to performing arts at, at nine, at least nine. I may have, I mean, at the most nine, I may have been eight, but I think it was around nine and um, did musical theater is what they did back then. So I was just in the, in the course, you know, I, I remember I was in the cast of Oliver and uh, I was a big deal. I had a line. Nice. I, I think it was, I brought the boy mum. <laughs> so, you know that was that was a big deal to have a line back then and i, I had i did, did a few others carousel i had uh, played a uh, character and uh, carousel and a couple of others but i just i love the the performance of the live audience uh, m uh mainly the people you know i just i love show people you know and and uh, whether theater or film i i just have so much in common you know with with the uh, it's neat when when a group of people come together from all different walks of life and come together for a common goal. You know, it's it's really neat. So I just I just fell in love with it immediately. And then actually, when I when I uh, and we can get into this later, but I took about a forty year hiatus. And when I came back, uh, I'd, I'd done a, a film or two, but I, I started back on on stage to get some some experience. You know, I, one of my favorite old sayings is. Uh, uh, TV will make you rich. Movies will make you famous. Theater <laughs> will make you good. <laughs> mm. And uh, so I, I wanted to get some, uh, I, I needed some practice for, uh, auditioning. And so I started auditioning for some uh, community theater plays here. And, uh, and to my surprise, <laughs> started getting cast in some plays. So that was my first, my actually my first time back on stage after 40 years, uh, decided to start with something easy so it did Macbeth. <laughs> uh, I didn't play Macbeth but uh, anyway uh, so I did quite a bit of quite a bit of theater before I started you know um, switching into film and I, I, now I'm kind of like uh, Bill Murray said I prefer film over stage and film you only have to be good seven minutes at a time. <laughs> <laughs> So with your musical theater, you only had that one line, but wasn't there singing involved in your actual yeah. career? Yeah, there, there was singing. Um, and so that 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 served me well. I actually, I uh, uh, some of the recent theater I've done, the, the, the most enjoyable was with Arkansas Shakespeare Theater. 
mm. and it's changed since COVID. But <clears throat> pre-COVID, they used to do three Shakespeare plays and a musical uh, each 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 summer. And uh, the last musical that I was in there was Guys and Dolls, and I played Ar Arvide Abernathy, the, the father mm. of Sarah, uh, at the mission and. The, the, the young lady who played Sarah was a, is a New York actor who's been an equity actor, a professional actress for since she was a kid. And she has a voice like an angel. And the one scene where I sang, we were on stage together and I was the one singing. And it, <laughs> I, just, I never felt, never quite felt right, you know, but it was, it was fun. And I kind of realized that uh, the character I was playing and because uh, of my age and so forth, because there are some, also some remarkable Chad Bradford. There were some other remarkable singers in that show. And that wasn't what I was there to do. You know, I don't have to sing perfectly. I'm the old man singer. You know what I mean? It, it's kind of almost more touching if you don't sing well sometimes, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's more of an emotional thing. And it was a very emotional song about a father uh, and his daughter, you know, growing up and, and going away. And so it was uh, once I realized that, that I didn't have to, you know, have the chops of, uh, of a Chad Bradford or Rebecca. Uh, um, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to pronounce the last name wrong. Uh, Brudner, I believe it is. Brudner or Brudner. And I was corrected by her father and I don't remember <laughs> which it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but there's no singing in Yellowstone. Uh, nope. How did you get that character? How did you become that character? And what is it that... that Gives you that inspiration. Okay, I got a new character in this TV show. How am I going to approach it? So how did you approach it? And what was going through your mind when you were given that part? Right. Well, uh, that that's a the, there's a really long answer uh, because, you know, it took everything I'd done up to that moment to get that audition even. Um, <clears throat> and, and but a couple of the major things was getting uh, an agent uh, in Los Angeles, which when, when I, when she became my agent, she was in Florida, um, Jean Winger with Treasure Coast Talent. And she is, uh, the, the wife of a preacher and he was called to preach at a church in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. Anyway, I don't, I don't know the exact city, but anyway, she, uh, she called me one time. She said, you always wanted an LA agent. Now you have one. <laughs> so that was, you know, there's a lot of things that, uh, that shouldn't, shouldn't happen that have happened. You know what I mean? And uh, so that was, that was one thing getting an LA agent because that, that went through Bob Pesadera's office in LA. Um, another was uh, uh, some audition training I went through um, with Courtney Cunningham. I did some career training as well. I, I, I've been asked not to mention that because she's so backed up. She's like two years out. So she asked me not to mention that, but uh, she recommended Courtney Cunningham for audition training. She has a seven week course called book the room, book the role. Um, cause auditioning is not the same thing as acting. It's, there's, there's some slight differences, you know, uh, on the day of, uh, you know, it might be a, a wide scene, a, a, a close scene, other people around, you know, and the audition is just you and the camera. So there's some specific things. So I, I went through that training with her. And one of the things she teaches is to get coaching. So when I got that audition, I got coaching and there's something very specific that I'll go ahead and mention because it may help someone who's listening. Um, the sides uh, to that audition, um, it, it's me uh, basically arguing or chewing out a, a wolf scientist. <laughs> and the last line of that audition was the wolf scientist saying we have no evidence of any attacks from wolves. So that was the last line. Um, and I'm not, a, I'm not, I, in the past, I have not been a, a fan of buttons. Some people put a button on the end of their audition um, that's not necessarily written in the script. And I think that's, that can be dangerous, uh, especially from what I understand. Taylor Sheridan is uh, understandably fond of his words. He writes very well. Uh, but in this scene, it, after the scientist says that line, it says the crowd rushes the podium. And my coach, uh, Jennifer Lynn Warren, coached me for that audition. And she said that um, you may be the only actor there, you, the bunch of background actors, your background performers behind you, but you may be the only actor on set and they may need you as an actor to lead that surge forward. Um, so I did add a button on the end of that. He said that we have no evidence of it. And I said, oh, you got to be kidding, you know, or something like that. And that's how I ended the audition. 
And I, I, you know, who knows why I got the role. I, I, I think that played into it. Uh, and also, you know, to me, just getting the coaching increases the confidence, you know? So I was just, uh, I was confident that I was at the end of the day, that's all you can do is, is, uh, do a, a good job with your audition. I recently saw, uh, someone, I think they were quoting, uh, I don't remember who they were quoting, but he said, your job is not to get the role. Your job is to put forth your version of that character. You know, the best you can do it. Another thing I've been latching onto here recently, uh, it's in, uh, I think it's in Stanislavski's book, uh, An Actor Prepares. It says, you may play it well, you may play it poorly, but you must play it truthfully. You know, so if I can do a truthful uh, 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 version of how I see that character, that's my job. And then if that's the same vision that the producers and the director uh, and the showrunner and everybody has for that, then that's when it happens. And evidently that's, that's what happened, you know? Um, so, so then, uh, when I, things happen so quickly, that's why I, I really don't do theater anymore because the turnaround so quick on shows. Cause I had the audition. I don't remember the exact dates, but, uh, I think my agent called me on like a, a Tuesday and told me, uh, they had, I was put on a veil. They had checked my availability which is great. Uh, and then I think Wednesday or maybe Wednesday, they check my veil Thursday, they sent an offer and I traveled Friday, you know, so it was just boom, boom, boom. And, uh, I traveled up to Montana, uh, flew out Friday, got in town. They had a, they have so many people coming in and out. They're not enough rental cars. So they, uh, I think in the, I think they, they, the term, maybe not in film, but I think maybe, a a term for pilots of a hot seat where, you know, there's a rental car that some other actor had used in the, in the airport parking lot with the keys in it, you know, <laughs> and that's when, when I left, I left the, the rental car in the parking lot with the keys in it. And uh, so anyway, I flew in, went and got my COVID test, went and got fitted. Uh, and then we, we didn't shoot till Monday. So I had the weekend to kind of explore a little bit of Montana, you know, and kind of take in the area, which I think was very important. If I was going to be playing a Montana rancher, I wanted to kind of get a feel for what that was like, you know, but I was just, I was beyond thrilled to get that role. You know, the, the biggest role I'd had before then was uh, a wonderful role working with Renee Zellweger on the thing about Pam. And um, so getting, getting those network co-stars uh, is very important. You know, usually you don't get a shot at a guest star role until you have, you know, a handful of uh, co-star roles. So, you know, that, that's, that's good. <laughs> and and uh, one thing, though, that uh, I learned, uh, listen to the podcast, Audrey Helps Actors. She talks about as you get more credits, it doesn't get easier. It gets harder because now I'm going against people that have multiple co-stars or, or even some guest star roles, you know. So the the, the road gets narrower, you know, and, and it gets it gets harder. But that's not to be discouraging. I don't find that discouraging at all. It's just uh, fact, you know, and I also know that uh, actors uh, uh, that are my age, if they've been doing it their entire lives, then they have, you know, sheets and sheets of credits. Like I, I wanted to be on Taylor Sheridan's uh, Bass Reeves, a new show coming out. And uh, I grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is where Bass Reeves rode out of the federal courthouse in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I grew up playing on those uh, gallows. So, uh, I knew the role of judge Parker, had, you know, was being cast and I thought, Oh man, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm that age. I have kind of a look for that. Well, Donald <laughs> Sutherland got the role, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so, you know, I have kind of the look and the age of, of guys like that. So, you know, I understand. Uh, I think Donald Sutherland's an amazing actor. And of course he'll bring a huge audience with him. Um, so that's, not that I'm competing with Donald Sutherland on every role. I, didn't, I mean, I didn't even have a shot. I didn't have an audition for that because those are going to go to named actors, you know. But you know, sometimes producers, directors are looking for new faces, and you know, it's hard to think of this as a fresh face, but <laughs> it's not a known face. But you have your own followers, so Donald Sutherland has years and years and years of followers, like. My mother and I, we used to like him back in the 70s and, and we used to follow Kiefer's work. So you have your own followers. And I guess it's depending what famous, uh, how famous the person is. But, you know, you're famous in your own right. Um, you said that you uh, 
you worked alongside Renee Zellweger. Is she the most famous celebrity you've worked with? <laughs> I suppose so. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really thrilled to have worked with uh, uh, two Academy Award winning actors. I worked with Tatum O'Neill and God's Not Dead of Light and Darkness, the youngest actor to ever win uh, an Academy Award. And Tatum. then Renee Zellweger, who, who won two Academy Awards. And, and that's just an incredible to work with with people like that. You know, I play golf I, or I, mm -hmm. I swing. There's a thin line between swinging a club and looking like an idiot and playing golf. So I'm somewhere. <laughs> in the, um, but when I do play with golfers who are better, usually I play a little bit better, you know. And so I think working with actors like that really uh, 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 makes me want at least want to up my game. And I think it does up my game. Uh, and the, the, the first time that ever happened was on the set of God's Not Dead, A Light and Darkness. I worked with Ted McGinley, John Corbett, and Tatum O'Neill. And uh, that was just an incredible, incredible experience. Yeah. David R. A. David A. R. White is my favorite actor. And I've watched all the um, God is Not Dead series. And that's great to hear that. Wow, you're such a prolific actor. Yeah. Uh, you said you don't do theater anymore. But uh, I want to talk to you about your, um, your play. Duncan in the Savage Muse, which you were talking uh -huh. about Macbeth before. Ron. Uh -huh. How did it feel playing that part? Well, it was it was so funny because I, you know, I don't have any training. I, I you know, I, because of some decisions I made, bad decisions I made for many years. You know, I didn't, I don't have any schooling to speak of, and uh, so I don't, I didn't know the first thing about Shakespeare. And there was one line that Duncan had, and it was I, I don't remember the line exactly, but it, it had like delivered uh, i think may have been the word and i asked the director i said is that delivered or deliver ed because yeah. i'd heard i'd heard shakespeare before and she yeah. starts counting and i thought what and she counted and she said it's delivered okay i had no idea what you i didn't know what iambic pentameter was you know okay. I, I didn't even know what that was uh thankfully i had the, the opportunity to be in uh uh, uh um, Midsummer Night's Dream with Arkansas Shakespeare Theater, and I I studied a lot before the first day of rehearsal, because that was that was my first equity production, my first professional production, and by golly, at the first table table read, most of the actors were off book, and they weren't just reading, you know, they were they were acting, and we were you know discussing discussing the uh, uh, the, the the different words because you know there can be different interpretations of, of the Shakespeare because there's you know the the original Shakespeare was never written down you know so we have the first folio and the second folio and different interpretations of that but uh, anyway um, I, I thankfully have learned a lot more about Shakespeare but just a just a drop in the bucket but a lot more than I and knew when the, I played Duncan. what was that a lot more than I knew when I played Duncan. <laughs> And then the curtain opens and here the main um, performers come out and they do their scene. Has there ever been a time that you actually flubbed a scene? Yeah, in, uh, uh, it was in West Side Story. I played Lieutenant Shrank and that was at Arkansas Shakespeare Theater. And, uh, and it was a despicable character. And I really, I was not the first person offered the role. Another actor was offered the role and wouldn't do it because he mm -hmm. was, a, he was a, a race, a, a bigot and a, a, a bully and just a, a sexist and a misogynist and just a just a horrible character uh which was challenging but but you know i always say actors have queer ideas of fun it was fun you know in a in a in a, in a very weird way um but there was one time where i come in and there's a there's a a, a, a racial term i'm going to i'm going to use because it was the line i come in and i call the lead a spick and I say, oh, you don't want me to call you Spick. So I, I'm doing that saying, and I say, oh, I'm not supposed to call you Spick. And I realized I had not called him. I had dropped that line. So I had to, you know, I, luckily I was able to quickly recover. Uh, and it seems like, you know, it seems like 10 minutes. It was probably 10 seconds and no one noticed. But golly, that it gets your heart going. But that was I the only time you... I, I think I that was the only time I ever dropped a line. Um, uh, no, well, on, on a live performance, there was a there was a uh, class I took uh, uh, with uh, from the, the artistic director of Arkansas Shakespeare Theater. Um, uh, golly, Rebecca. <laughs> 
I can't believe I can't remember Rebecca's name. Anyway, that that showcase or whatever at the end of the at the end of the workshop, I dropped a line in my scene and I kind of like looked at my scene partner and they were, you know, again, it was probably five seconds. Right. But it seemed like an attorney. I looked at them for help and they looked at me like I can't help you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't familiar with the Dar Man and the Dramatize Me series and several other YouTube channels. These actors are paid to be racist. These actors are paid, but the thing is, the actual, the actual uh, thing with the the theme of these videos is that it displays a message, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's pretty well, good. I, but I, I, what I kept telling myself was that you know, if I have to play the dark to let people see the light. Then, then I'm willing to do that. Matter of fact, I had a role, I had an audition for a role that was, uh, a, a, it was just a despicable person. I, it was a, of a sexual nature. I won't go into it. And I, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to do it. And I talked to my, my coach, Jennifer Warren, and she said, here's why you need to do that. She said, first of all, you need to do this so, so that people know there are men like that out there. Secondly, if a woman is willing to play that type of role, then you need to be willing to play that type of role also. And then she, she also said, and I won't use the language she used. She uses very colorful language, which I appreciate it. I think there's a place for that. She said, secondly, if you're only in this to do the roles you like, then you're in the wrong business. You know, so I did the audition and I didn't, I didn't get the role, but I, it didn't feel good. <laughs> and I, not, I can understand not that. There are some roles like, I, you know, I, I would be comfortable turning it down. Uh, I've turned down some roles before, but uh, but I appreciated her opinion. I value her opinion. So I uh, did the audition. I said, but you have to read with me. <laughs> the thing is, is that if you had to play a serial killer, people will be known. Oh, look, it's, it's Barry Clifton. He's a serial killer. I wouldn't want to be known that my last part in a movie is a serial killer. I mean, yeah. I w people say I do a pretty good villain, but uh, at the same time, I want if, – if I ever – like bump into one of my fans, like you probably have been recognized. Do they recognize you as character from Yellowstone? Do they recognize you as a character in, in God's Not Dead? When they see you, what do they say? Barry Clifton, actor, character. Uh, I can't believe. No. I remember no, that movie no, I, I saw no. you in called what? <laughs> no, I've never been recognized. <laughs> I mean, friends, you know, friends here in the local uh, uh, film and t film uh, community here in Little Rock, but that's about it. Wow. What was it like working with David A.R. White? And what was it like? It was good. I'll tell you, you know, David, uh, he didn't have near the experience that these actors do. I know David's been in a lot of stuff, but, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, John Corbett and Ted McGinley uh, were both series regulars, you know, on, on shows. And uh, it mm -hmm. was it was really funny because John Corbett was, uh, he's a force uh, to be reckoned with. And I, there, I talked to, there was one actor on the set that didn't, didn't particularly care for it, the way he did things, but because of his experience and his confidence, we were doing one scene and uh, I think David was in the scene uh, and, uh, and Ted McGinley and uh, the lawyers, myself and the other two lawyers had stormed out of the room and they were supposed to stop and break down and then shoot the next scene that was just uh, John Corbett. And David, I think John Corbett and David Arrow White, I believe it was. And uh, John Corbett called the director over, uh, John Gunn, and he said, Hey, why don't we just go ahead and shoot that scene right here? We're already here. Why don't we just shoot that scene? And he said, Let me think about that. And then they came back, John Gunn came back and he said, Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we just go ahead and shoot that scene right here? <laughs> and another <laughs> thing, uh, uh, well, two more things about John Corbett. Um, one is he, he, he talked about flubbing a line on film. I, I flubbed the line before, but that's, that's easy. You just, you know, you keep going unless the director says cut, you just keep going because they can use a portion of it, you know, when they edit it. So John Corbett uh, messed up on a line and, and he said, wait, wait, wait. You know, in other words, he told them not to cut. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. He said, watch this, watch this. And, you know, and he, and he delivered it. He, he had a thought, you know, about what, and, and he delivered it. I don't remember what the line was or whatever, but it was good. And he had that kind of confidence. Another thing I will mention, uh, there was a scene that I was doing with him where he was talking about the merits of the church on campus. I was a lawyer for the campus trying to kick the church off. And 
he was talking about the merits of the church. And I said, well, I realize the church has its merits, but that's not the case. That's not the issue or whatever. And so, you know, they had, they do a shot where it's over the sh over his shoulder on me or over my shoulder on him. So when it was over his shoulder and the camera was on me, he didn't say the lines that were in the script. He said, well, I will, I want you to know that this church has supplied alcohol for alcoholics and drugs for drug addicts for years and years and years. <laughs> Instead of saying that they had, you know, he did it intentionally, you know, and, <laughs> and it, 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 it threw me off every time, but he was just having fun. <laughs> Well, sometimes actors in movies and films and even TV shows would ad lib something, which is usually kept in. Like, for instance, mm -hmm. Dick Van Dyke was asked about uh, the theme music in the Dick Van Dyke show when he trips over the bolster there. The, he said it wasn't; in, it was uh, an accident, and they kept it. Yeah. But um, that's well, very I think interesting. That also, I've read that uh, Anthony Hopkins in uh, Silence of the Lambs, the whole the whole bit with the <laughs> nice Chianti that that was ad lib. Yeah. So it's possible that, uh, you know, the directors and others would mind unless you want to screw around with actors and say something totally different as an honest script and see the reaction. I was talking to another actor and she, and she said that uh, about crying now. Um, what's the secret to crying? If you have to cry in a, in a scene, uh, she says, don't cry. And as soon as you say don't cry and you're not trying to cry, you end up crying. What would your approach to doing a um an emotion for instance let's see anger crying upset well i've just recently and i can't talk about it, it's not public knowledge yet but i was uh offered a role in a film and the scene was an emotional scene where where i end up crying at the end and a few things i've learned about that uh in natalie portman's master class she talks about not rehearsing the emotion um, because if you do, you know, you're either going to get stuck in a rut of, of feeling the same emotion over and over. And she always talks about don't don't be willing to to uh, do the take over again. Be willing to take the entire journey over again from start to finish, you know, because I try to be as organic as possible while still serving the story and, and the script and so forth. But um, <clears throat> so I, I have not rehearsed the emotion. I actually because of the nature of the scene, uh, the dialogue itself was, was, was simple. So I had not rehearsed at all. Um, and I got on, uh, I use a platform called we audition. I'm a reader on we audition for other actors and I get on there to get readers myself. And so I got a, a, a actor that I trusted, you know, because I was going to just let it go. I was just going to be, uh, as open and vulnerable and honest as I possibly could be. So I wanted someone I trusted. So that wouldn't be an issue. Um, and I also heard that, uh, you know, that if you cry, the audience won't. But if you if you almost cry, you know, or hold yourself back mm. from crying, the audience won't. But I didn't. Now, all this stuff was subconscious. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and the second time I did two takes and the second take, I said, that's it. I'm done. Uh, my voice cracked a little bit at the end. I didn't you know, that wasn't planned. It was just it just what happened. And uh, I don't think a tear actually fell down my face, but tears had welled up in my eye. Um, but I didn't know I didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, if I if I allow myself to think about it, I could get apprehensive about what's going to happen on the day of, you know, when I'm on set. But I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to trust the trust in the work that I've done already on the audition and trust in the work that I'll do once I get the full uh, the full script, because I had to, you know, we're supposed to portray the character in the given circumstances. Well, a lot of times when you get an audition, the only circumstances, you know, are these three pages, you know, or whatever. So I didn't know exactly uh, what was going through his head. So I made something up, you know, I, I made something up. Uh, and uh, uh, my coach always tells me to make the stakes bigger. Like I had an audition for, a, it was for uh, the Disney uh, treasure, uh, treasure film um national treasure i think at disney national yes. treasure and uh so i was, one with I was cage i'm sorry the one with nick cage no 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 a new a new one i think it's a tv a for, for disney but anyway uh i had an audition for an older man that was uh trying to help these kids out and so my audition coach she said well what's what's the treasure 
and I said something about gold or whatever. She said, no, 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 no. She said, you need to make it much more, you know, like the secret to uh, uh, eternal life or, uh, you know, the, the, the secret to faster than light travel or something, you know, just make the stakes bigger, 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 bigger. So when I did that audition uh, that required, it was pretty emotional audition. You know, I made the stakes pretty big. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the circumstances weren't given. So I made up some circumstances that were, that were pretty big <laughs> and evidently it, it was what they were looking for. But usually if you had to display um, a character where you're angry because your daughter was murdered or you're angry because you were ripped off like a billion dollars, like they're totally different emotions. But unless you've actually experienced it, you have to really, really um, give the directors or people who are reading for the other character um, you really have to like, for instance, for some scenes, I heard that you're doing your scene first and you're actually talking and being emotional with like a, a, a reader who's actually reading the other line. And then the one who's supposed to be talking to you will be given that opportunity to read to someone who's reading your line. And then they edit it together. You have to make it look like you're literally actually um connecting or, or interacting with that other character and showing the emotion if, if the one you're she says i'm panicking emily's gone and you're like where was she but you have to do it in a way like she's actually right there and that your daughter emily is missing or whatever hmm. and um how to become so real in your characters you have to put in a lot of um practice like i bet you for a few scenes in yellowstone they probably had to do the scene many many times before they got what they wanted um were you able to in yellowstone now were, were you able to interact with kevin costner at all and no, have you ever there was, a, there was a flashback scene so i work with okay. josh lucas i'm sorry go ahead and finish the question okay so when you see how we acts in certain movies or whoever you want in, uh, inspires you do you try to do what they do do you just try to put a little bit of clifton spin on it no i, I read something that I, I really believe is true they said if it's it's always better to base a character on a real person than on another character so you know there's just some times when i when i first read a script or something i might think oh that's kind of like uh doc whatever in back to the future but i don't try to base the character on, on that character. You know, I try to find someone in real life or find that person in me, you know, and, and, and do that. Uh, but that's not to say I admire the heck out of other actors and, and, uh, uh, and love watching their work, but I really don't try to, I don't try to mimic other actors or, or anything of that nature. Well, I'm a tennis um, player and, People who are better tennis players than I am, I usually like to be as good as them. So they kind of like mm -hmm. inspire me to be better. It's yeah, just yeah. people that you play tennis with or play any sport or whatever who are like really worse players. You're like, oh, now I have to play worse in order to catch up with them, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So, but that's why I think that because, and you were working with Renee Zellwerker, does her acting um, live up to par? Like when you hear about her acting, does she really? really put herself into the part oh yeah uh and, and the thing about pam you know she was paying playing uh pam uh uh is it pam hup i think and so that was a that was a total different character that i've ever seen her play and oh yeah mm -hmm. she bought into it 100 percent. and and uh she was she was incredible to work with and she was just it was such a flamboyant character you know uh and that's that's not her at all you know, she, she's, she's kind and friendly and open, but not, uh, uh, you know, she's not, didn't appear to me, I don't know her well or anything, but she didn't appear to be an extrovert, you know, but Pam was very much an extrovert. And so she, she very much, uh, bought into that role. <laughs> when you're handed a script and say, okay, how long does it take you to, do you, do you go through the script and removing lines and getting deep into it and, and practicing in front of family or a mirror? Or 
do like the table reads help you more than they do if you're just reading with somebody? Well, I think for a, for a stage play, a table read is great. Uh, and in theater, you know, that's what some people really love about theater is that you have a chance to rehearse it, you know, for, you know, a couple of months before you ever put it in front of an audience film. You, you never do. Very seldom do you get any rehearsal at all. Uh, like in, in Yellowstone, we were rolling, you know, first time. Um, and I kind of like that. I, I prefer that. But but as far as the uh, I, I never do it in front of a mirror again, that's uh I think it was Natalie Portman's master class, but I don't remember where I heard it, but they said never rehearse in front of a mirror. Cause I don't want to get stuck into anything. Like I said, I try to keep it as organic as possible because I think it's very important to think about maybe how I'm going to say a line or uh, 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 when I'm going to turn my head or whatever the case may be. Think about that in very great detail. And then as soon as the camera's rolling, forget all that, just forget everything you did and hope, that it comes out organically, you know, hope that it comes out from your subconscious uh, and trust the work that you've done. Because I don't, I don't think it's, I don't, if I'm thinking about that when I'm doing the scene, then I'm not in the scene, you know? So it, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing. Uh, and there's sometimes when you just can't tap into the subconscious, you have to just uh, kind of act as if, you know, you just have to act from the outside in kind of. Well, I know the Dustin Hoffman masterclass, he says that if you're talking to someone from one side, he says, make sure you're doing that scene, whatever it is, interacting with somebody that you're yelling at them. Um, say it in a way that you want to break the window. So you would say like, get out of my house. Or if you're just saying in front of someone who you don't want in your house, you wouldn't say, just get out of my house. You know, you got to do it in like an emotion. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, would you figure that what would be the most challenging role that you've ever played that had to give your entire Barry Clifton acting experience in the role to drop the mic type thing? Huh. Well, I, I suppose, I, I don't know if it's the most challenging, but it was one of the first was a film uh, called Shady White that's available on Amazon prime. And in Shady White, I was I was the the uh, the uh, antagonist, and it was a, a southern kind of southern mafia guy. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think the director did a really good job of talk uh, of hinting at the horrific things that I that my character had done without going into detail, because again they were of a sexual nature, and he just kind of brushed over them mm. so that you knew what that what he was what was going on, but they didn't dwell on it. Um, but this, this, uh, young lady who had, uh, had been in my care for many years, uh, I called her my daughter, uh, and she said, I'm, I'm not your daughter. And I said, well, maybe not in the true sense of the word. She said, not by any, you know, the things you made me do. And I turn on her, I said, you earned your keep, you know, and it was just this, this terrific, horrible moment. And he told it's me, the done. director told me, cause he had seen me do some other stuff and I'd played like the goofy old man or been in some <laughs> kind of student film comedies and things like that. And he wasn't sure if I could bring what was needed for that role. And so it was a real gratifying moment too, because the first take, I think is what we used for that scene. And uh, we were doing that scene. I spun around her, and, you know, and I said, you earned your keep, you know, whatever the other line was. And then he goes cut. And it was just silent for about three seconds. And he goes, damn, Barry, you know, so it was, it was, it was, it was good to get that kind of reaction, you know? So that was one of the most gratifying. Uh, and I wasn't sure if I could bring what he wanted either, but um, evidently I did now in, in Yellowstone, you know, I was uh, very angry, um, but it was, it was, it was, you know, for the audition again is one thing because it's me over here in my studio, you know, but when I'm on set, we're in an actual town hall. There are 50 or so actual sure enough ranchers and cowboys from all over the country in, wow. in, as extras. And then there's this, this podium up there with these official looking people, you know, and I've never liked authority anyway. <laughs> so it just makes it so much easier on set, you know, cause you have all that stuff, um, all that uh, uh, stimulation from, from different things. And I did Barry, it, what uh, do you think? Go ahead. Uh, sir. Say, say that, um, even that, you know, I did it uh, like one take. I would do it just purely pure anger, 
angry at the guy. The next scene, I would do it where I was thinking, you, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and, and I just had little different motivations. And, and whether they looked different or not, I don't know. But I was I had different thoughts going through my head each time. And um, what I learned in theater, uh, you know, used to would get together after every rehearsal and the director would have notes. Um, and I, I didn't get any notes. It would kind of bother me, you know. But I finally learned that no notes is good notes, you know. So uh, we started shooting on uh, on Yellowstone, and it was uh, 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 Christina Boros was the director, and she was amazing. And we started shooting, and she didn't, you know, we did half dozen takes, dozen takes, and she'd never said anything. And then when we were changing setups, because you were talking about shooting the scene multiple times, not only that, you shoot it multiple times from multiple angles. So you know, you you made twenty takes from from seven different angles. So we had done about a dozen takes and the only note I ever got from her, she came up, put her hand on my shoulder, said, you're doing fantastic. So I just kept doing what I was doing um, but with just a little variation, because I know in editing, they're going to, you know, either either pick little bits from two or three of them or pick one in particular or, or what have you. I mean, I was happy with the one they with the one they picked. Of course, they, you know, they showed Josh Lucas some while I was talking, but I knew they would because, you know, it's Josh Lucas and the, the show is about uh um john dutton you know and josh lucas plays the young john dutton so of course they're going to show john dutton walking into the courtroom you know or the town hall rather yeah barry what what's your take on method acting like you might get a part where you're a serial killer or maybe you're um you're screaming at someone or you're bummer what, what makes you think that you won't take that character home with you and go oh shoot i forgot i'm like for instance, well, I, there was a movie that Richard Gere did that he had to be a homeless man. So what he did is he, he he was a homeless man for a week. He went through garbage. He ate what was in there. Nobody recognized him, and he did that just for his part as a homeless man. What's your take on that? Uh, I don't know that you know if someone does that, you know that's fantastic. Uh, I don't know. I tell you, when I played Lieutenant Shrank, I didn't go around being a bigot, but I did go around thinking like there was a particular scene where I was uh, just, just barged into this woman's apartment. And, and I saw, so I was just going around thinking, how can I be more despicable? You know, which is, which is not a good place to be. And, and actually there was, there was a, a weird, this was a weird experience. Uh, I wish I could remember the actor's name who played uh, Maria's best friend in West Side Story. And this lady had played that role like eight or nine times. And she was, uh, 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 obviously she was just a very strong woman you could in real life, you know, and one of my, one of the scenes was I come in and I push her and the, and of course on stage, you don't really push anyone. I just touch her with my fingers and then she, she, she does, she does the rest, you know, so you don't really push them. But, um, and I could tell that woman had not been pushed maybe once in her life, but she was not a woman that you would push in real life, you know, and, and I'm not a person who would push a woman. So it was a it, the first time we rehearsed that I kind of teared up afterwards. It was an awkward feeling, um, and, and so that rolls like that took a little while to shake off. Uh, I remember one of the first student films I was in. I played uh, I was a, a young abusive husband, and my daughter was a child. And then uh, at the end, by the end of the film, my daughter's grown up. And I, I that one day when I like hit my wife or whatever, I turned my life around. And started getting better but my, of course my daughter who was little at the time and saw that this is all in a movie now um she still did not trust me and then the day of her marriage uh i said i just i just want to be your daddy again and we danced together um and so it was kind of weird because for a couple of days i would remember that time when i hit my wife i was like no you, you never hit your wife <laughs> you know <laughs> that was that was kind of odd but I, yeah. I, I think it's important for your mental health to, to not go or, or to get out of that stuff. You can go as far as you want, as long as you can get out quickly. When you mentioned that scene about how, you, you you know, your daughter grows up and then you're just wanting to be her daddy again and you dance. That reminded me of that scene from Scrooge with Alistair Sim. Alistair mm -hmm. Sim, when, when uh, he went into the hallway because his nephew invited him for dinner and he says to his nephew, uh, niece-in-law that um can you forgive a man who had no ears to hear with no eyes to see with all these years 
So he changed his life, not because he was visited by three spirits, but because he literally changed his life. And that's the way it is for abusive people who just suddenly decide to change your life. And it's hard to, um, if, unless you've been there, it's hard to actually, like you said, you know, you have to put yourself in that. But, um, but I was also reading here uh, that you're also equestrian as well. Did um, horses have anything to do with your getting your part on Yellowstone? No, that, that came afterwards. I, I, I did uh, because I, I have a vision board and one of those is, is uh, was book, one of those visions was booking a role in a Western. So I tried before COVID, I had started taking riding lessons. And when COVID hit, I, I was still working a full-time job at that time. So it was difficult to get out there for riding lessons. Um, and, uh, and then COVID happened and, and all kind of stuff with, with work at the time. And so that just kind of fell off. Uh, so I put that aside. And then I was in Yellowstone, and uh, which is a Western. It's a neo-Western, you know, but I, 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 I did achieve one of, my, one of my visions. And that's still a goal of mine. I think I have a, a good look for that. I think it fits me. As my manager says, it's, it's like a, it's a glove. You know, some of those roles are gloves. Um, but I want to be able to uh, uh, put that on my resume that I can ride horses. And I, you, that's something you don't put on your resume unless you can do it. Uh, I, I read a story about a, a, someone who did that and, and they just had to cancel the shooting and reschedule. And that cost a tremendous amount of money. And that guy won't ever work again for those people and probably mm. many other people. So <clears throat> I just uh, a few months ago, I've been calling some places and, and I called a lady and she said uh, that they didn't really do that. But she said, oh, wait a minute, let me recommend someone. And she mentioned a, a woman named Carol Jones with American Acres uh, Training Center. And so I called her and told her that I was an actor and wanted to learn how to ride, that I had been on Yellowstone, you know, and, and wanted to be on horseback next time I was on Yellowstone or, or an opportunity came up. So started taking lessons. I didn't know who she was. I have since found out that she has 40 plus world championship titles and, and Western pleasure and all wow. these other. She trains horses primarily, but when she trains horses, she also trains the rider. So she trains the horses for the rider and the rider for the horse. So she's, she's uh, an amazing horse person uh, and not, not so much the English style, you know, but she does, uh, I don't even know the names of all the classes, but Western pleasure. And then there's ranch and something. So she teaches and she loves Yellowstone because they actually do real things on a horse. I mean, they have the horses that stop real fast, you know, but that's a specific skill, but they have regular ranch horses that, you know, you go through a gate on horseback and then you, you close the gate on horseback. That's, you know, that requires four or five different specific moves that she's taught me, you know, how to go, go backwards, how to sidestep with the horse, how to uh, do a forefront turn or whatever it is where you just, just, where you just turn the front of the horse or where you just turn the rear of the horse or all these things have to be combined to do some mm -hmm. basic tasks that you'll find yourself doing on a ranch. And, and also the, the way that they, uh, uh, at the horse shows where they go to, to be judged, they're given patterns, you know, they'll go out and they'll go around these cones and then they'll walk over these boards and trot around these boards and go here and then step backwards. And she said, you know, it'll be the same thing when you're on set, you'll, you'll be given a pattern, you know, it, it won't be like that, but they'll say, go out this gate, go to that pasture and turn around and see someone, you know, whatever it'll be, it'll be some specific directions that I need to be able to do exactly you know, what they're saying. And it's like, you know, uh, uh, Spencer Tracy once said, you know, uh, learn your lines and don't bump into furniture. That, that's all. <laughs> you got to find your mark, you know, well, finding your mark on your own two feet is sometimes hard enough, you know, because you don't want, you can't look down. So finding your mark, but, fi but finding your mark on horseback, you know, that's a whole other thing. Uh, matter of fact, last Tuesday's lesson is, is a little bit embarrassing, but I'm just learning. So it's okay. I mean, I've, I've, I think I've come a long way, but uh, we had not loped or galloped uh, much. So we, we're, we're still working on that. And uh, I was thinking about something else and she said, okay, go ahead and stop. So I said, whoa. And of course the horse stopped and I, I, I went forward and had a surprised look on my face and she kind of chuckled. She said, when you tell him to stop, don't be surprised when he stops. <laughs> so she told me uh, again, you know, how to, how to use my knees and, and set my butt down on the saddle and, and how to prepare for that, you know? So we, we, then of course we did it again and it was fine. <laughs> <laughs>
So I take it, Barry, that if there's a part that you really want, would you go and learn? Like they say that if you wanted to be a window washer and you're afraid of heights. So your character's a window washer. You have to go to the 17th, 18th floor and higher, and they're going to film you washing a window, but you're afraid of heights. So how would you do that character? How would you? Yeah, I would absolutely, if I had the opportunity, I would absolutely go go wash windows. As a matter of fact, uh, kind of interesting. And, and you know, I, I forget where I first heard uh, an actor talking about, and they were talking about stage, about taking in the space. And so uh, every night, Arkansas Shakespeare Theater, I would go out on the stage, you know, before the house was open and uh, and just kind of take in the environment. And so I've taken that into film as well as much as I can. So in the thing about Pam, uh, I knew where it was going to shoot. It was going to shoot at an actual convenience store. And the day before we were to shoot, I drove out to the convenience store and I made I actually made a dear friend. Uh, Cajun Plaisance is her name. And she's a, a, a Cajun down there in the new orleans and she was working at the convenience store and i said excuse me i said we're going to be filming this film tomorrow and i'm going to be a convenience store worker would you mind if i you know maybe came behind the counter and kind of got a feel for the oh sure so she set up a stool for me come on back you know we ended up talking for hours and we still are friends on facebook as a matter of fact she sent me some uh olive salad from central grocery and a big old uh cajun food package just recently <laughs> um but anyway, that, that that was so kind of her. But it was it was important for me to not walk into that space for the first time on the day we were shooting. You know, I saw how she made change and this, that, and the other. Now, some of that may not have served me well. There was a little uh, interesting thing about that, uh, and um, that was directed by Scott Winnett, who had won two Emmys for Thirty Something. He was the director in, in those scenes, and. Um, so Renee comes up to the counter and is buying stuff, you know, and so I'm checking her out and all this stuff. And, and the director kept saying, that's not in the frame. That's not in the frame. Don't worry about that. No. And Renee and I both, she was saying, there's just a lot of business going on because she had to yeah. fill her Slurpee. She had to get a cup, fill her Slurpee, <laughs> put a straw on it, put a cap on it, come in, pick out a keychain, put it down, ring it up. You know, all this stuff, all this business, she says, a lot of business going on. And, and he said, we'll do that later. So when you see our hands exchanging money and stuff, it's not our hands. That was a pickup shot they did later. Um, but we kept trying to do it. And he had to tell us a couple of times, no, no, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but it just, it seems more natural to do it, you know, to do it for real. If you're, you know, uh, but anyway, I wanted to see how she made change, where the cigarettes were, whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. And of course the store, they totally changed the store. Uh, overnight i mean they had a it was amazing when i showed up on set there were probably at least 15 trailers and uh two wow. or three hundred people and there were three actors that day <laughs> <laughs> but they had it was in like june maybe in new orleans and there was snow piled up on the curb outside the convenience store that they put there you know i mean it was the, the and, and the, this this whole uh convenience store this whole section of the convenience store with the chill chugs drink machine and all this stuff it was just totally transformed <laughs> they had an army of people doing it very talented very skilled people yeah that's how many people you need just for like they're shooting a they were shooting a commercial up here and they were shooting part of a movie down here it's always these white trailers that have the the names of the actors the actors on it and there's like five trailers and and police whatever and it's it may just be like one or two actors doing the actual scene uh do you believe art imitates life or vice versa and why uh i i, I don't know i think i think probably some of some of both um i will say as far as that goes i think sometimes art can at its best maybe challenge some of your viewpoints uh um and, and maybe make you think about something more deeply than you have before so in that way then i think that would be life imitating art not necessarily imitating but life being changed by art you know and that's that's the roles you really want to get so often it's you know, like I had an audition recently where I'm a convenience store clerk again. And I said, can I help you? We're out of that. Can I help you with something else? And that's, that's the, that's the character, you know, so th that, that's not too inspiring, but occasionally you do get a role, uh, where, where 
uh, has some some meat on it, you know, and and uh, yeah, those those are the roles you you want uh, because uh, I you know I've been uh, I don't I I don't know if I've changed drastically because of a film or stage, but I've been affected um, definitely been affected. There's some performances that I still think about today. Um, as a matter of fact, there's one in particular I'll just mention as a, for example, there's a wonderful musical called um, Next to Normal, which is a musical about mental health, which sounds doesn't sound like it would be sound like it would be odd, but it was brilliant. And, and it just really uh, uh, kind of changed some of my thoughts and perspectives on, on mental health and gave me a deeper understanding of it, I think. And that's 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 good art right there, you know. <laughs> well, I do believe that if they're going to have a character that is like schizophrenic or uh, is autistic, you definitely have to get someone that has these actual real ailments. So you would have to, there's a lot of actors out there that have these ailments and especially like parts for people with Down syndrome as well. There's a lot of great actors I know that are wonderful actors and actresses who have Down syndrome and stuff. So what you're saying is now, do you... But do you think an artist has a responsibility to convey a positive message through the work? And so if you said, have you ever said no to a project because the content or message wasn't right? I have. Um, there was a role, again, it was a, it was a, it was a sexual thing. And uh, I won't go into the specifics, but when I, when I, when they offered me the role, uh, they said, have you read the script? And I said, no, 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 but that, that's okay. And they said, okay. And then I read the script and I was like, no, I'm not doing it. And they said, yeah, but this is just implied. It's implied. And I said, yeah, yeah, but when you imply it, it's so obvious what they're doing. And so I didn't do that. Um, and there was another, another thing I turned down and it was uh, kind of on the other end of the spectrum. You know, it was, uh, uh, you know, there's some, some of the faith-based films are good. Some of them, or the other kind. <laughs> so it's not necessarily because it's a, it's a, it just may not be a fit for me. You know, I, I don't doubt that there was probably a positive message in the film, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a good fit for me. Uh, the other one, there was not a positive message. It was just pure entertainment. It was a horror film with a lot of sexual content, which a lot of horror films have. And, and if you're into that, that's fine. You know, it's just something I didn't want to do. Yeah, like, for instance, God's Not Dead I th with Kevin Sorbo. I think they should have just stopped at the first one because the second and third, I mean, except the one that you were in, wasn't really good. I think that they're just trying to capitalize on that God's Not Dead thing. And um, there's, there's maybe they fourth, are. I think they're casting a fifth now. Oh, there is. Wow. <laughs> but see, I, and see I, liked, I liked three because uh it was the first one john corbett played a non-believer in that film and it was the first time they didn't almost dehumanize the non-believer you know they made him a nice likable guy even though he was a non-believer you know which i think i think is important to not not uh, demonize someone just because they they may not happen to have the same beliefs as you and and he came off as a likable guy uh of course, in the, in the film, the 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 characters the, the uh, of faith kind of pitied him, I suppose. But that's 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 fine, you know. But he, uh, I, I enjoyed that part of the film. And of course, I like John Corbett is just a really good actor. And Kevin Downs a, is a good one too. Yeah, and I wanted to mention one thing to go back to something you talked about a long time ago was uh, uh, delivering my lines to a reader or to uh, mm -hmm. a, a green screen or just to nobody. And fortunately, I've not. I've only had to do that once, and that was in a little forty-eight hour film thing. But uh, on the major shows I've been in, I haven't had to do that. Uh, and I, I witnessed something in God's Not Dead, where it was Tatum O'Neill and Ted McGinley, and they were at different ends of a conference table having a, a, a heated emotional discussion because she was the president of the university, and she told Ted McGinley that he had to tell David A. R. White's character that they had to get off the campus. And he said, but he's my friend. And she said, I know that's why she was making him do it. You know, so it was a really emotional scene. And so when they did the over the shoulder on Ted McGinley, he was great. 
And then they switched, they, they, they flipped the world is the way that uh, director of photography put it. They flipped the world, put the camera on Tatum O'Neill over Ted McGinley's shoulder. And he was every bit as much emotional and plugged in as he was when the camera was on him. And at the end of that scene, Tatum O'Neill went up to him and said, thanks Ted for, for, for that. You know, I knew exactly what she was talking about. He said, Oh, absolutely. You know, so they talk about actors being generous. You know, I think that's, that's a big part of what they mean. You know, you, you're, you're giving everything you have for your other character. Matter of fact, I've heard that, you know, the more you can make the scene about the other character, the better, the better it is, you know, um, because it's not about, it's not about me. It's not about my character. Anyway, yeah. I just wanted to, that's something I meant to mention earlier when you talked about uh, delivering lines to a, uh, that, that would be challenging. And, and I think I would, I would be able to do it. Um, my, my, one of my audition coaches, uh, Courtney Cunningham is real big on visualization, you know, so I would just have to visualize that person there and uh, do a little bit of work on that ahead of time. It'd be nice if I knew it was going to happen beforehand so I could be prepared for it. Uh, the time I did have to do that, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't know it was going to happen. And I had not, uh, when it was over the shoulder on my scene partner, I was giving it my all. And I maybe should have held back a little bit and saved a little something for when the camera was on me. <laughs> Oh, what makes a good actor? Um, I notice in a lot of movies and films, the actors, actresses, that sometimes they look in the, stare straight in the, in the camera. Mm -hmm. I'm like, isn't the job as an actor to pretend there's no camera there? Like, what makes what would prevent, what makes well, you I, stop looking in the camera? You're not supposed to. Uh, I I don't know. I I, I do know that. Um, Again, I quote, I quote her masterclass a lot, Natalie Portman, I believe it was she, who said, you know, don't try to shut the camera out, you know, welcome it in, you know, it, it's, it's there, it's part of the environment, don't try to shut it out, because that doesn't, that doesn't work, it's, it's artificial, you know, um, so I know the cameras are there, but I don't think about them, like when, when we did uh, uh, on Yellowstone, they had five cameras on set. And the last, the last take we did, all five cameras were on the stage behind the podium, pointed out towards the audience. And that, <laughs> when you know, when, when they're changing cameras and lighting and stuff, we go into the green room, right? So we don't, we don't see what they're doing. And uh, uh, and Josh Lucas was very nice, and we talked a lot about the business and so forth. But anyway, we come out for the next setup, and I'm looking up, and there's five cameras pointing at me. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it's something I thought about briefly, but once we started rolling, uh, I didn't think about it. And matter of fact, I did that on stage too. And I know I, I've heard, I've heard several uh, stage actors talk about feeding off the audience, you know, and learning from their reactions and tweaking their performance based on their reactions and things like that. And uh, I, I kind of just tuned them out and I don't know if that's uh, a good thing or not, but there was a, uh, a play I was doing and I, uh, I went on before this other actor, you know, my scene was prior to hers and I came back after my scene. She said, how's the audience tonight? And I was like, uh, I don't know <laughs> what audience, you know, uh, I don't know. Um, but I just kind of, uh, I don't intentionally tune them out, I guess. I guess I'm just so into the other, the situation and the other characters and so forth that I don't really think about it. And the, the one time, like I've had to look into the lens on some auditions. I, I don't think I've, I don't think I've done that in film or TV, but auditions sometimes like you may be auditioning a scene when you're, where you're on a zoom meeting, you know, you see that quite a bit. And if I was auditioning for a, you know, a scene in a zoom meeting, it might be proper to look directly into the camera. Yeah, notice you have a website specifically dedicated to teaching others how to be an actor, like some of the really great reviews that you have and a uh, certain amount of money you pay per hour for someone to get uh, acting experience, which is pretty good. It's, it's a good side job. I see that you have second act. I was going to ask you what that meant, second act actor. Well, that, that, that shouldn't, it, shouldn't it say first rate actor? <laughs> <laughs> No, that, that, that phrase was coined by uh, Audrey Moore, T 
to, to my knowledge, uh, Audrey Helps Actors is her podcast, an amazing podcast. And she talked about uh, actors, and, and she kind of has a, a place in her heart for second act actors because they're people who come into acting maybe after another career, maybe later in life. Um, and she says oftentimes, which was the case for me, I've experienced so much, uh, you know, I've not been in a, like a, the, the bubble of, of Hollywood, you know, I've, I've experienced uh, uh, corporate America, for instance, um, and uh, marriage and divorce and alcoholism and all sorts of stuff, you know, that uh, uh, outside uh, of acting and all that can be used. And there's a certain uh, she talks about, I don't know if I would like to use the word mature when it comes to me, but she talks about a certain maturity sometimes that second act actors have. So I really, I, I like that. Uh, and I've talked to her. It's okay for me to use that phrase. She does want me to credit her with the thing. So uh, I told her when I, I purchased the URL, secondactactor.com, uh, I have since uh, given that URL to, to someone else, just told them to take over payments if they want it. But uh I met uh, Janet McMorty uh, about the same time I bought secondactactor.com. She bought secondactactors.com, plural, and uh, found out she has a and she used she has a podcast called Second Act Actors, where she interviews uh, predominantly actors who have come into it after another career. She's a she's a practicing physician and an actor, mm. um, so she interviews a lot. But she, she's interviewed casting directors, and she just interviewed a voice over casting wow. director things like that, but she's really, she, she does it very actively. And I, I built second act actor.com uh, with the idea initially of just providing links and resources and maybe writing a blog once a week or so about something I've learned or experienced. And I just didn't keep up with it. It's not my passion. I'm not, I'm not going to keep up with it. So I said, Hey, if you want that URL, just take over payments. But that was my, and it's still out there. I think I still have links to uh, Courtney Cunningham and, and, uh, uh, Image by Buckley, the image consultant that I use for my headshots, and uh, um, Audrey Helps Actors, and uh, Bonnie Gillespie Self Management for Actors, and some other resources that I found helpful. Yeah, I love and interviewing I, actors and actresses, and uh, also we recently interviewed a um, a executive producer of Friends just recently named Diane Strand, and. Uh, Got some really good feedback from her. So love doing that. And yeah. so that's why we asked you on our platform. And I really got to check that out. Uh, what is that? Second, second act actor.com. I think okay. it's, I don't, and I, like I said, I've, I've offered it to Janet and I, I'm not real savvy on ownership of websites and so forth, but, it, but I, I think I successfully transferred that domain to her and there's nothing, you know, it's not due for another year. Uh, and I, I, I think, I suggested that she used it just as a uh, redirect, you know, so if people go to secondactactor.com by mistake, it will take them to her website. Because like I said, she's very active on her website. Um, and the other one is honest. Audrey does actors as well. Audrey helps actors. Audrey helps actors. Okay. Audrey helps actors. And she, mm -hmm. uh, she has a, 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 she's an LA actor with, numerous credits so she's a working actor as well as doing this podcast you know she's a working actor but her podcast is amazingly helpful and followed by thousands of people and uh, uh she has something every may called uh, self-tape may uh that many many actors take part of where she challenges you to do 16 self-tapes in the month of may um and uh it's a lot of fun anyone who does 16 or more self-tapes in the month of may their name's going to hat and she draws one to be on her show um, so that's a little, that's a lot of fun and good. Okay, training. Before we awesome. We really loved having you on the podcast. And before we, we have a few more questions for you, but everyone mm -hmm. hit the subscribe button and down below in description, all of the, you have the um, actors reel for Barry Clifton and information there. Um, so I'd like to ask you, do you own any interesting props or costumes from previous roles? Uh, yeah. Uh, you're going to see my messy house. Let me see if you can see it. <laughs> okay. There's a, there's a bloody shirt right there. Why? Hey, wow. Look at that. There's, my, there's a wall, wall of shame. Um, and you got, you, and you got cinema, so the cinema or air, air 
those are those are plays mostly. And over here, if you can see the wow. chill chugs, that's a cup. That's a chill chugs cup from the thing about. Oh pan. wow, I love it. <laughs> Thanks for showing us that. Yeah, that's great. Love it. Yeah, I uh, I wish. Yeah, I wish I would have uh, asked Miss Elwiger to autograph it. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I'm sure she would have. Um, man, wow. Um, how do you yeah, end up I, have, I have that from previous yeah. films, but as far as props now, I've got a little prop locker where I'm starting to build up things like a, a coffee cup nice. or a, 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 a matter of fact, I absconded with this. Where is that? Uh, uh, from West Side Story. I, I didn't, you know, it is sometimes easier to seek forgiveness than to seek permission. <laughs> so they have these these pack of packages of cigarettes that are oh. made out of wood. <laughs> and I just, uh, if anyone from Arkansas Shakespeare Theater ever sees this, I've got your pack of cigarettes. They had several of them, and I, I took one. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, and the, you know, Lieutenant Shrank stole three packs during the show. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a secret of how to uh, smoke as well, and not really smoke, but how to make it look like you're smoking. Um, secrets of the Actors Guild as well. Uh, so how do you handle personal criticism about your work? You know, there, there's. I've been taught there are two types of criticism. There's, there's valid criticism and invalid criticism. And... and uh, if it's invalid criticism, I need to let it roll off me like water off a duck's back. If it's valid criticism, then I need to take it for what it's worth and and change it if I can. So if it's someone if it's someone who who doesn't act, um, you know, th th I, I I pretty well disregard it. Um, now, if if they say that, even if they say they didn't didn't believe the character or something of that nature. That's you know I, I I hate it if they you know if they didn't but I don't I don't really let it bother me now. Thankfully I've not, um, you know I've not really had a big enough role to receive either praise or criticism. So that, matter of fact I I did a uh, I did a student film, and I, to me it was the it was the the worst criticism ever from uh, and again it was student film and the students got critiques from their professor. And I was the grandfather and he said the grandfather was okay. <laughs> and I thought that was, so I would rather have, he stunk or he was fabulous, but to just be okay, I think is the worst. <laughs> you know? Again, you know, you, you may play it well, you may play it poorly, but you must play it truthfully. So I didn't either, I didn't play it well or poorly. I just played it safe, I guess. I don't know. And I, and I yeah. knew, I knew when I got the criticism that that, that that was correct because I knew what I put into it and I didn't put in to it what I should have. I didn't understand the character. I didn't agree with what was going on. And, and that's, that's BS. If I agree to do a role, I need to buy into it and trust the, trust the director, trust the, the writer, trust everything about it. Even if it's a student film, it doesn't matter. I'm like uh, Jennifer Warren, who coaches me quite often, she says if she has an audition for a two-line co-star, she treats it as if it's an audition for a series regular. Wow. You know, every, every, everything. It's, it's got to be all or nothing. It's not an oh, by the way kind of thing, you know. That's amazing. One final question is someone who wants to get into the industry. What is one piece of advice to get them started? Um, as soon as possible get together a good package head your headshots need to rat, match your resume need to match your demo reel casting has to know where to put on for film and tv casting needs to know where to put you quickly um someone once told me casting directors didn't have like if you audition for one role but you might be good for another role someone said well casting doesn't have the imagination to picture you in that other role which is absolutely false. Casting directors have amazing imaginations, but they don't have time. If they're auditioning for the janitor, they're looking for the janitor. They're looking for the janitor. They don't have time to say, oh, you know, he might make a good car salesman. No, they're looking for the janitor, you know, mm -hmm. but I've had two casting directors tell me specifically that, that they really appreciate how clear my package is because my headshots, they can tell 
my headshots match my resume, match my demo reel pretty closely enough to where they can see immediately where to put me. And I used to fight against that. I used to think, I don't want to get typecast. I can do anything. I can be a villain. I can, you know, I, I, I like saying, you know, never pass, pass up a chance to play God or the devil. You know, <laughs> I think I can play either one. But um, but the thing is, you, you casting needs to know where to, where to put you. Yeah, but you don't want to be typecast like you mentioned. Like, you know, he, he played a really good uh, sexual deviant or he played a really good wife beater. Let's just put him in these roles as wife beaters or he played a good angry man or good drunk. He plays a great drunk. Let's uh, you know, you don't want that. You want to be well, able to well, play well, anyway. Audrey, Audrey Moore talks about that as being your ticket in. You know, mm-hmm. if, that, if, if you're good at playing a deviant or a, 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 a drug dealer or, or an abuser or whatever the case may be, if that's how casting sees you, that's your ticket in. And then once you get some credits behind your belt, once casting directors learn who you are, once directors know they can trust you, once producers get to know you, uh, then you can start branching out. But that may be your ticket in, you know, your, your ticket to the show. <laughs> Do you think Clint Eastwood was typecast because he's never played a, uh, an evil character? It's always a good, you know, hey, punk. That's not necessarily yeah. an evil character, though. I, I don't know. I, I know, in his, of course, his later productions are his productions, you know, so he's cast however the heck he wants to be cast. <laughs> but So if, if he was typecast, it was a long time ago. This is amazing. We're so happy to have Barry Clifton from Yellowstone and quite a crowd of great actor um thank you barry for being on our show and we really appreciate you talking to us and sharing your acting journey and your little musical journey that you had there and your shakespearean journey and wow and uh so thank you so much for this opportunity to interview you and we look forward to seeing you more in yellowstone and look forward to seeing you more in in are you in the God is not dead series or just that one? Just that one. Um, I, and, you know, since I played an attorney for the university, uh, you know, and it was a, it was a supporting role. So it was, you know, I had quite a bit of screen time, so it kind of makes it difficult to play another role. It depends on how they feel about that. If someone would say, Oh, that's the lawyer from three. What's he doing is, you know, the preacher <laughs> in five, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I would love to. I'd love to do it, though. I was going to mention to you, T- Ted McGinley was in Happy Days when Ron Howard left the part, mm-hmm. and uh, he's yeah. a prolific actor. I actually, I'm a Christian. I love watching the Pure Flix uh, series and uh, A. R. White's. Uh, Ted McGinley's been in a few. Oh yeah, uh, just well, and, and I, I still uh, just uh, if you don't mind a moment about Ted McGinley, I I I gave him. Uh, my nickname for Ted McGinley is the nicest man in Hollywood. Um, mm. uh, I got his email address when we were working on God's Not Dead, and I emailed him, uh, and he actually was instrumental in getting me a ticket to the premiere. And uh, just super nice guy. And he's, he's got a new show out uh, called Shrinking. He, he plays the name. You know, he was in he was in Love Boat and 30-something. I'm in Love Boat and... Uh, uh, Oh, now that I said 30 something, I won't be able to think of it. He was in Love Boat <laughs> and Married with Children. Mm-hmm, yeah. And he was the neighbor in Married with Children. He's the neighbor in, in Shrinking, does a remarkable job. Um, it's a really good show, too. Shrinking on, uh, I believe it's on Hulu or maybe Apple TV. I don't That's remember. It's amazing. I don't well, Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford is in Shrinking as well. And is I don't he? know that Harrison Ford has ever done television before, but he's, he's incredible. Plays a grumpy old the- psychologist. Yeah, you, you never know <laughs> yeah, if you're familiar with all his work. Um, probably these big high-class celebrities just prefer just films, but, you know. But thank you so much, Barry. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. It. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, we're going to end this recording. See you, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you.